Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. What a great Lord's Day last week to stare in the Word of God. And Thomas, you, you shouldn't have sang that song. I want to preach Revelation 5 again, brother. <laughs> so just to have that fellowship together and that meal, and it was just a, a rich day. So grateful for that. Uh, welcome to any visitors that are with us this morning. We are glad to have you come worship with us. I'd like to remind you as well, this Saturday will be the memorial service for our dear sister Ruth Stevens. She was promoted to glory. Um, so grateful for what um, she's beholding right now. And I called her Stevens, it's Stephens. <clears throat> Wanted to remind you, the men's retreat is going to be coming up, sign-ups. If you would go do that, we're going to lock in for a day and just... Uh, dig in the Word of God together, and then as well the sign up for the women's entrench. Uh, they're going to be doing the same thing, so we encourage you to, to sign up for those where the whole body of Christ gets to come together with the men and the women studying and wanting to grow in their faith, so just encourage you uh, toward that. This morning we're going to be continuing in our study in Romans, so if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 12, I want to read the section that we're in currently right now, verse 9. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another and honor. Outdo one another in showing honor to others. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. This is the life of the one who's been joined to Jesus Christ by faith alone. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would produce these beautiful fruits in each and every believing heart here this morning. God, I pray that this gospel that is so full, so rich, so salvific, it brings us blameless into your presence, Lord, with confidence. And I pray, Lord, that, that every one of us, by your spirit, through, through your word, renewing our minds, that we would grow in how we love. God, help us to be done with self-love, hypocritical love, exalting love. God, let it, let it be that we die in, in this gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ and that now to serve others, to give our, our members to be servants of Jesus Christ by serving his bride. Lord, grow us, change us into these kind of men, women, and children by your Holy Spirit as we believe, as we by faith continue to gaze upon the glories and the beauties of the one who's worthy. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ, and I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would just floodlight him that we would see him in all his glory and he would be put on display this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to focus on verse 12. Such a beautiful passage, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. These qualities are uh, one man called the three missing jewels in contemporary Christianity. And I've been praying that everyone in this place would have these crown jewels comprising their faith. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to skip my introduction. Don't get used to it, okay? I want to, I want to give it at the end, okay? It's my conclusion because what I want to do this morning, I want to open up this verse, understand what Paul's exhorting us to as the children of God, and then come back and put these three traits or characteristics into its context and the whole chapter, and so we have to get that because that is the beautiful truth that Paul's trying to work out to bring us to the obedience of faith, to bring us to verse 2, his will for his children, and how it ties into this whole section on a love that is not hypocritical, or you're going to miss this Christ-like quality that Paul's seeking to build into us in this section. So let's just start then by looking uh, at the meat and bones of this passage, Paul's going to show us three qualities of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. He's going to call us to live with a real hope and real troubles 
because we have a real means of help and prayer that is now a throne of grace for the child of God. So let's take these three up together. Look with me at rejoicing and hope. This is, this is big to Paul. This is big. We, we can't mess up the sequence here. I want you to look. Rejoicing is what we call a participle. And a participle is modifying our hope. And so what Paul's saying is we are saved into hope. We have faith, hope, and love. And we'll see that these three just feed off each other. And the greatest of these is love. And that's what this whole section is moving with. Faith is the therefore. We have hope and it manifests love. And this is where Paul is leading us. So faith in Jesus Christ alone brings us in to hope. It it leads us to have hope. A hope in the future and what God's doing, where this whole world's moving, this, this world that is dying and has no hope. We've been brought into this sphere, this realm now of hope. We, we have a hope. Faith in Jesus Christ leads us into this. Paul said earlier in Romans 8, for in hope we have been saved. We, we've been saved into this blessed hope. Peter said we've been born again into a living hope by Jesus Christ. Paul said in chapter 5, we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. We long for glorification and what's coming because of this gospel. So rejoicing then comes out of the womb of hope. How do I be a rejoicing one? It, it, it's, it's coming out of the blessed hope that you have, child of God, through Jesus Christ. And if we've lost our blessed hope, and we try to rejoice, it's plastic, it's fake, it's just put on. It, it, it just, it can't, it's got to come out of hope. This is not just a hopeful outlook. It's not just a cheerful temperament, a Pollyanna spirit. Our text draws quickly to what it is. There's a, what's called a definite article in the Greek to show that it's the hope. So we are to rejoice in the hope, the hope of all hopes. And all other hopes give way to this one. This is the one true one that we possess, and that's why it's called the blessed hope, that we are going to be with Christ forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And this whole Bible says, because of Jesus, there is a certainty. There's a confident expectation to our future glory. We've been going through Romans, and Paul is wanting you to get how certain it is that you will enter into this hope. The return of Jesus Christ is the foundation stone of Christianity, the two advents. He came, he died, and he's coming again to usher in our blessed hope where it'll be the consummation of all things in Christ, the summing up of all things in Jesus. And so clearly as I know how, our hope is that we're going to be with God in glory, beholding his glory and reflecting his glory for all of eternity is the hope of the child of God. And all of Romans has just been leading us to its certainty. By faith, we can bank everything on this hope. Whatever you've come in here carrying, whatever weights and burdens, I just want you to lift them, just looking to the hope that you have in this gospel. The the hope and the second coming of Jesus Christ are married. And so our our great hope is Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come consummate this, finish it, our blessed hope, let it be today. And that is the marriage that Paul's talking about. And now this participle comes into our hope and it says as believers, we are rejoicing in this hope. That's where our rejoicing comes from. I'm going to see his face. I'm rejoicing because my future is so good. I'm I'm just rejoicing in what what Paul called the blessed hope. Our rejoicing is in hope. And so hear this, our rejoicing can't be in our present circumstances. It's got to be in this certainty that's coming. It can't be in life and when it's going well. I've spent so much of my life trying to get my life in order so that I could rejoice. If I could just fix this, then I could finally, oh, I could could have rejoicing. I could have peace. But right when I get it, something else goes wrong. 
And I'm always like that kid at the, the Elitches where you're hitting those things that are popping up. And my hope does the exact same thing. The circumstances just keep coming and moving and changing. And every time I get there and say, soul, take your rest, enjoy, something new comes to disrupt it. And so my rejoicing was, was a slave to my circumstances. And what I've been asking God all morning is if that's your battle, that he would lift it this morning. I quickly, I guess slowly, learned that my rejoicing was in a person who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not change, and not in circumstances. A person who I am engaged to, and my marriage is coming, and his love will never come off of me, no matter what he sees in me, no matter what comes into my life or doesn't. I have this blessed hope. Rejoicing was, was not getting a beach, a house on the beach with a door that opens to the waves. It's not a secluded mountain with a stream flowing by to calm your soul. It's not when all my kids love the Lord and have no trials. It's not when you finally have that special someone who cares about you in every high and stormy gale. When everyone, I, as a shepherd, it, it was like when everyone at the church would just be those fat little chubby sheep sitting in those green pastures, eating content and happy. I spent my whole life trying to get those sheep on that little green pasture. And it, I keep thinking, I got it. They're there. Bah! I'm, I'm cast. And my trials are so hard, I feel like I'm going to die. And you got to run and lift them up and get circulation going again and bring them back in the fold. And then there's one budding another one and fighting and struggling. And tomorrow we got we to gotta go to the shadow of the valley to get to higher ground with our walk with God. And there's flies and gnats every day driving us crazy. And, and we need to anoint them with oil. And as I'm looking at scripture, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoicing and hope. And the next phrase, persevering in tribulation. How do those two marry? And that's my question to you, can they? Because much of Christianity today says they can't. And God says they must. And so I want you to see that there's a way to be rejoicing in hope and persevering in tribulations. It just felt elusive based on my circumstances so this morning, how do you get to that place in a fallen world that God says, expect tribulation? How do I shepherd my own heart and you to this place? Because this is heaven on earth if you can get to this place. And some of you live in it and you know how sweet it is. And some of you are in the battle as you're sitting here this morning. You, you can't rejoice until the circumstances are fixed. You can't rejoice until you get rid of this or lose that or gain that. And that is not what Jesus came to give us. I've come to give you abundant life and to be rejoicing in hope this morning, right now. And so our hope must be up beyond the horizon of this world. Our hope is not in this world. This world is passing away. It's condemned. It's been subjected to futility in Romans 8. Our spirit is alive, our body's dead, it's still cursed, we still have disease, decay, uh, children getting sick, dying. If your hope is in this circumstantial world, I promise you it's going to perish. It's a false hope, it's a dying hope. And so I want to press you right now to bless you, to bless you. What is your hope truly in? And I just don't want a Sunday school answer, I want honesty as you sit here before God. Christianity is slowly becoming a here and now religion. It's a club instead of citizens of another world. And it's wrong because our hope awaits us. And we live in this wilderness waiting for the full redemption when the trumpet will sound and the Lord is going to return. And that's the blessed hope of the believer. Come, Lord Jesus. So what is this hope? What is this hope that our joy is to be rooted in it? The fruit of true joy will never spring up unless our roots go down into our blessed hope. And that's why I think Americans are so hopeless, that we've got to get our roots 
And to what is this hope? And that's why we have a therefore in Romans 12.1. The hope is this gospel that your sins have been washed away and they're separated as far as the east is from the west and you are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and you have peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ. That's your hope. And by the mercies of God and what he's done in Christ, you have hope. And so this hope, I can't exaggerate it or overstate it. I just remember as a kid, every time I went on vacation, every time I took my kids on vacation, at the end of it, they're always disappointed. Heaven will not be like that. Anything I tell you this morning is going to fall short. Every description I take it, I give you from the Bible, it, it just it won't fully get it. It's going to be ultimate relief, ultimate freedom, ultimate joy, ultimate peace, ultimate safety, ultimate satisfaction, ultimate worship. And Christ is going to be there as head over all. The gospel tells you, for the believer in Christ, it's certain. And it's ours by faith. And it's undefiled. It will not fade away. Moth and rust cannot destroy. It is absolute. I wonder how many people live on that daily. One second of eternity will more than compensate for every trial that you ever persevered through. And all the joys that you could ever get in this world will be nothing to the one moment you have in glory. This is what is certain for the one who has laid hold of Jesus Christ. This is what we've been made for, to to live with one eye to this. To take your eyes off of this, your rejoicing will be circumstantial. And this is the ones who get their eye on this who can do our next calling. So be willing to leave this behind, this cursed earth. Paul said, the grace of God has appeared, Jesus Christ, into this world, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. How? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Because their hope is fixed. They're saved by Jesus' first coming. Their eyes are just, they don't have to get it all here now. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my blessed hope. He's coming. Thomas Boston, the great Puritan, remember this is in the 1600s, so work with the language. But he said, it is worth observing that there are such a variety of scripture notions of heaven, heaven's happiness that it may suit every afflicted case of the saints. <clears throat> are they oppressed? Then the day will come in which they will have dominion. Are they reduced to poverty? Heaven is a treasure and so is Christ. Have they been f- forced to quit their habitations? The Father's mansion is ready for them. Are they driven out of their homes into the wilderness? then there is a city prepared for them. Are they banished from their native country? Then they will inherit a better one. Is their life full of bitterness? Then heaven is a paradise. Do they groan under the remains of spiritual sin? Then theirs is glorious liberty abiding for them in heaven. Do their defiled garments make them ashamed? Then the day is coming when their robes shall be white, pure, and spotless. Does the battle against the flesh and blood and principalities and powers render them weary? Then there's going to come a day of glorious triumph. If the toil and labor of the Christian life be great, then there's an everlasting rest for them in heaven. Do they complain of frequent interruptions in communion with God? Then they shall go no more out of God's face, but they'll be with him forever. Do they grapple with death here? Then will be eternal life. Yes, he that overcometh shall have all these things. And it is our faith, he said, that overcomes the world. Rejoicing in hope. Let every believing soul hear afresh this morning, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is better than any circumstance that you're trying to fix or get. This hope will purify you. It's yours by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not in your finished work. Fall on Jesus this morning and believe in him and you will not be disappointed. So you realize what you have laid up for you, child of God. 
rejoicing in hope. Secondly, persevering in tribulation. So we see that we have a hope that is certain. And we have present tribulation that is certain. You have both. They're both guaranteed. They're both certain. My pages are wanting to stick this morning. Salvation does not separate us from trouble and tribulation. It's not uh, the exodus in the land of Goshen when they were protected by all the plagues of the world. Tribulation, it meant pressure. It meant to squeeze. The, 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 the word tribulon was this instrument that you would crush corn to get the flour out. And so these are the things that are pressing so heavily upon you this morning. There are temptations and persecutions and trials. The, the, they, they just squeeze. They're a constant pressure. It fills our church. The trials and tribulations in this body are many and multicolored and intense and common. How should we react then to tribulation? We're told, don't be surprised. We have to lose this romantic view of the Christian life. It's a battle and it's a fight and it's an evil world. Jesus Christ said, in this world, you will have tribulations. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Peter said, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Don't think it's strange. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions, these squeezings, for you yourselves know that you've been destined for these. God has predestined suffering and trials for every child. 2 Timothy 3.12, and indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is not how to win friends and influence people. This is light and darkness will hate it. Christ was a man of sorrows. He said, if you hate me, they're going to hate you. If you live Romans 12, they're going to spit you out. Paul wrote this beautiful, or Paul, the writer of Hebrews, wrote this in Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and all those witnesses suffered and endured and persevered for the prize, let us lay aside every uh, encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you might not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and your striving against sin." Live for Christ and the world will hate you when you get out of step with it. Don't seek and expect your comfort here. This is not a mountaintop experience for your whole life here. Paul wrote, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despairing. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We're always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also might be manifested in our body. Job said, as sparks fly upward, so does man been destined for trouble. So my question to you this morning, what do we do with this reality then of what we're learning in the scriptures? And then the call is to embrace it and believe it. I had a lady who was listening to our live stream and she said, I want to come to Southside, but my, my husband is just not there spiritually, and all he wants is encouraging and positive sermons. And I was in Romans 8 telling him what I'm telling you this morning. He goes, that guy's so depressing, I could never go to church there. And he's still dark and depressed and hopeless because your best life book didn't fix his problem. So what I want you to see this morning is by looking at reality and the truth of what God says is how we're going to fix it. So it isn't, I, I just want to ignore this. I just want a happy life. I don't want to think about hard times. I'm going to leave this church because he's telling me things I don't like. That'll never bring you to the fullness of joy that we're looking at. Rejoicing in our hope. And so how do we get there? You got to persevere, he said. Greek word means to abide under, to, to remain under these, these afflictions, this world that we've been brought into. It will be here the rest of your days and it will increase. It will increase as we age and the trials that will come into our lives. 
So the key, he's saying, don't spend all your days trying to change this. I could save you so many years if you could hear this. I wish someone would have told me this when I was younger. Don't spend all your days. I promise you, kale, investments, insurance, extras, they're not going to fix this. And you know that this is the path that God has set before you. He sets the obstacle course. You run it. Looking to Jesus. God picked your course, every one of your lives. And he just says, run it and run it, fixing your eyes on the author and perfecter of faith. You're going to suffer. You're going to have trials. Just look at Jesus. That's the blessed hope. That's where this whole thing is going. Stare at Jesus. Look your eyes out. You're going to be squeezed, pressed. Quit trying to make Denver paradise and, and run to paradise. Jesus, look at the finish line. I persevere in tribulations by rejoicing in hope. One of Thomas's favorite songs, we're almost home. <laughs> we're almost home. That's why the afflicted church is the strong church. They're filled with hope. And this is why the American church has struggled so much to be a force and a witness because we made our hope Denver and we've put our tent stakes down and we're using religion to try to have a happier life. It's garbage. It's a lie. This is why true hope is filling this church. A few weeks ago, Joe Steffens, not Stevens, came up to me. His wife just went to be with glory like that. And he said, man, I've been reading this book on heaven. And I, I've never had such a hope in my life. I'm just looking at him with joy all over his face. Saying, how is this trial driving you to rejoice in hope? While he's persevering under huge tribulation and hard things. This is it. We had a lady come in for prayer for the, over the elders, praying over her for possible cancer and decisions that are life or death. And she just sat there smiling rejoicing, crying, just filled the whole room with Jesus. And she walked out and I just sat there feeling sorry for me. It's as if every saint I talk to is God is meeting you and filling you with hope. If you're a new believer or, or this is new to you, grab some of these old ones who God has led to understand this. And grab one of them and say, can you disciple me in how to rejoice in hope while in tribulations? They're just everywhere uh, in this body and you, you need to learn it. And just say, will you, will you meet with me till I get this? I call this endurance with expectancy. I'm enduring because I, I know for certain what is coming for me. And I join Paul and say, I consider that all these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in me. One second. Everything I ever went through on this earth will not it'll pale in comparison to what I have. James says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And to say it simply, all our tribulations are to drive our roots deeper into the joy of our blessed hope. And there's a God who loves you, and he's going to keep making it where you can't sustain yourself. Your strength won't be enough. And he's just going to keep bringing things into your life that I have to drive into this blessed hope of Jesus Christ. And tribulations, they just, they purify our hope. They cut off the flesh growing over our hearts. I, we need, the worst tribulation is to have no tribulations. The worst affliction is to not be afflicted at all. I need help looking at my blessed hope or I'll just be a fat American, happy and sassy. I need trials to start saying, my hope is that. My hope isn't here. And so thank you, God, that, that you bring these things to where I can't even survive unless I go to my blessed hope and what this is all about. So I need Jesus. The best is yet to come. 
We live in this already, not yet. He, he saved us, but what's coming is the final salvation. Death being conquered. I live in that. Turn to Romans 5. Paul laid this out clearer for us earlier. And I just want to come back to that because it's been 10 years since we were there. <laughs> Sean said it was last month, but he was wrong. Romans 5, <coughs> the favorite word, of course, therefore, because you're justified by faith in Christ alone. Therefore, having been justified by faith, when you believe this gospel, you were declared righteous before God. It was a moment in time. It's not 10 years of trying and working. The moment you believed, you are justified by faith. And when you do, instead of being an enemy of God, you now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the therefore. That's what all of Romans has been teaching. So get that. And now he goes in verse 2, through whom also you've obtained your introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So now, instead of standing with the, the disfavor of God and the wrath of God upon you by this gospel, you now stand in grace the favor and the acceptance and the love of God to the work of Jesus Christ, you stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We exult in the hope of where this gospel is going to bring us now to glory. And then verse 3 takes your breath away. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. We exult in the gospel and we exalt in tribulations? How do you do that? Well, you got to know that tribulation brings about perseverance. It, it brings about this strengthening in the gospel and faith. And it brings about, the perseverance will bring about proven character. It will begin to change you and make you godly. And proven character will bring you to hope because these trials will take you away from hoping in your own strength, your own abilities, your own cleverness to fix things. It will bring you to this place of the blessed hope. My only hope is Jesus Christ and glory. That's what they're for. And this hope will never disappoint. You'll never stand on the last day and not hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It will not disappoint. I've put my hope in so many things. Bitcoin. And it disappointed. And it messed up my whole life. Hope, this will not disappoint you. I promise. Because why? The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so I just, this morning, I want you to see we are rejoicing in hope and we're persevering in tribulations because they're, they're purifying our focus and our journey and purifying us. And so we, we, we need them. They're gifts from God. They're going to boil off unbelief. They're going to boil off putting your tent stakes here. These are gifts from God. This is why these seasoned sufferers walk around here saying, I pray this trial never ends because I'm drinking up Jesus Christ in a way that I've never known. Don't run from them. Go back to Romans 12. We should go through Romans again. Mm. Oh, who was that? I'm buying you lunch. <laughs> and in verse 12, the third command imperative is to be devoted to prayer. And so what I want to do is take a whole Sunday and focus on that. I think it's an area that we need to grow uh, as a church. And the way this all ties together is so beautiful because if trials take me away from my sufficiency and my own strength, where is that going to lead me? To the, to the only one who can strengthen me and help me and bring me through trials. So you're devoted to prayer because we need God. No trials, weak prayer life. People in trial, you don't even have to encourage them to be devoted to prayer. It is what they do. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that next week. 
But what I would like to do now is give you my introduction. And, and you know we need 20 minutes for the introduction. That's not true. All right. I want to make application this morning, and I want to stick it back in its context like I normally do in my introduction. So I just want to ask you this morning, what do you do with this? Why did Paul drop verse 12 in this current section that we're now studying? Go back to verse 9. <clears throat> Let love be without hypocrisy. That's the leading statement of this section. And he's now showing us the will of God is to have this love that's not phony and fake. And there's a way through the gospel of Jesus Christ to begin to have a genuine love that's not perfect because of our remaining sin that's fighting me daily, but it's real and it's true for the first time. And this is the will of God renewing us to fulfill the law of God, to love him and love others. And so this is this beautiful love that Paul is driving at as the, the, the end of God. And he uses the word agape, which is that God kind of love. It's, it's, a, it's a love that is, though the world will never be able to imitate it. It's just, it comes from him and it's a love that is like no other. It's a love that I watch expressed on a weekly basis in this body. The church is too easily satisfied with fleshly, worked up, sentimental love. And this is to boil off that garbage, to get rid of that fake stuff. It's just sappy. It's not, it doesn't lay down its life and die. It's just, it's just, I don't know, love comes softly. What's the other one that everyone watches at Christmas? Come on. Huh? No, no, I'm thinking of the TV channel that everybody likes. And, oh, sorry, guys. Next thing you're going to say something about Donald Trump. <clears throat> we are to be metamorphosed and transformed into this kind of love. A love that doesn't end when it gets tested and stretched and differed. Paul has been renewing our minds in truth to bring about the obedience of faith. And it causes you to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good because you love them. And you're devoted to one another in brotherly love. And you, you give preference to one another in honor, washing each other's feet. And you want other people honored, not you. You don't lag behind in diligence. You're fervent in spirit because you're serving the Lord. And then we come to this verse, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, which makes one devoted to prayer. And so I need grace to be this kind of man, woman, or child. And doesn't it just feel off from the section? What? This is great truth, but it just feels like it should be in a different section. Why bring this up in the middle of love? The whole thing is about love. Next week, we're going to look at contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. That fits. I, I like that. That fits love really well. But this verse just seems out of place to me. So, so love. And so what I want you to see this morning, this is the best verse on love I've ever studied. So I don't want you to miss this because I think this is the key. If you're ever going to get the kind of love that Paul's talking about, you got to get verse 12. And so what, what is it that usually keeps us from this biblical agape kind of love? Well, it's, it's, a lot of times it's trials. Really hard ones. What happens when they come? I pull away. I just nurse my hurts. We're going to be tempted to make them our focus all day long. It's all I think about. I don't got time to think about your needs. Mine are huge. And I just spend all day long running around in my mind, my needs. And then I just feel like nobody loves me. Nobody really cares about me. It's a horrible hard battle not to go do that. It's really hard in trials. And what is more is what do we hear as one of the major criticisms of Romans 12 kind of believers? I hope someone has said this to you. Aren't you overdoing it a little bit? No, I'm not. You are so heavenly minded that you're not any earthly good. And what's Paul telling you this morning? The only way that you will ever be able to do people good and love them is if you're rejoicing in hope. You, you're no good to anyone on this earth if you are not heavenly minded. 
If you are not rejoicing in the blessed hope, alive to it, and loving people and pointing others to it, you can never truly love them. Just comforting them that don't worry, this earth is everything, and it gets better if you wait longer, and just give them all their little comforts about earth and how to put your tent stakes down. That is not love. What's love is, I know it's hard. Stephen's family, you are going to see Jesus Christ and dance with your mama and wife again. And that's comforted them. To persevere in tribulation, to put my roots down deep into my blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I can comfort others with the comfort that I received in my trial. In my trial, Jesus comforted me, and he showed me things and taught me things that were beautiful, and I could come alongside you now and comfort you because of what I received. My blessed hope that grew and deepened and weaned me off of hoping in this world. Now we can do people good. My friends, you cannot love well without this disposition. I'm telling you, this has everything to do with love. Those who persevere in tribulation are the best lovers that I've met. They're, they're, they're just humble. They're more truthful. They're more transparent. There's no front. They just break down and tell you how weak they are. They're just wanting to help others who are broken and suffering with the hope that they have in Christ. And they're longing for his soon return because the pain is so great. They've kind of lost their hope in fixing America. It's just in being fixed by Jesus Christ at the finish line. This is freedom to love. So that my life and difficulties do not sideline me and cause me to quit loving others and just nurse my own hurts and my own disappointments the rest of my journey to glory. There's something better than that. I love what John Collins said last week as we closed, as he's moving. He said he was so hurt as a teenager, he said, I was never going to go back into a church again. All of the hurt, uh, he was done trying to love and be hurt and slandered and asked to leave the church. And he said, a sweet brother who has suffered much came alongside of him, took him on a trip to Africa just shepherded him for 20 years and has loved and mentored him and made him a lover of Christ and other people. Our young marrieds have been so loved by that family um, in the midst of their suffering. And this is how, this is what happens. One preacher said, what does hope do for your future? It causes you not to drop out when it gets hard, but it will set you free from trying to get your own stuff trying to get everything you can from this world where I want this, I want that. And all your days are spent trying to get from this world. He says, this will finally set you free. It will it'll unhook you to be free to love others and sacrifice for other people. Let it go. Because over the next hill, everything you ever wanted or desired and then some is yours forever. And when you've been there 10,000 days, you'll have no less days to sing his praise than when you first began. I don't have to have it now. That makes you earthly good. To engage in pain and love the people around you, that's the key to love. So what is rejoicing in hope and persevering in tribulation and being devoted to prayer have to do with love? I'd, I'd say Everything. May this set you free to love the way that God has so loved you in Jesus Christ that in the verses to come, you actually weep with those who weep because you feel their pain. To God be the glory. I pray if you've come in here this morning and what I just described is, is, is why you're here. Is it's just, you, you just go from one hurt, pain, broken relationship, addiction to the, to the next, and you just keep traveling, and you just, every hope that you find in this world, it always dies. I, I just, I can't find hope. 
And what I want to give to you this morning is blessed hope. That God sent his son into this world to come and redeem it and to bring it back to him, to bring you back to him. And the way he did that was by putting his own son on a cross. Our sins put upon his son and God pulls out the sword of justice and he pierced his own son through for our transgressions. And God demands perfection to be in his presence. And the good news this morning is it's not your perfection. Jesus, born under the law, came and perfectly fulfilled it. And so that now, by faith, God will put to your record as if you lived the life that Jesus lived. And he'll treat you as if that you died the death that Jesus died. And I've always said, I will do anything to have that. I'll walk to New York on my hands if that's what God asks. And he asked you this morning to hold out an empty hand, to quit looking to yourself, your resolutions, your moral resolve, and to look only to Jesus and believe. And he says, you'll be saved. You'll be justified. You'll have peace with God and you will have a blessed hope that no one can take away. And so if you are just tired of that running to dead hopes, I got a living hope who was raised from the dead and now gives hope to everyone who comes to him and believes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this glorious gospel. I pray if there's any in here who who've just been living and dying hopes that this would be the morning that you would grant them the living hope of Jesus Christ. God, let them call upon him in the quietness of their heart now and be saved. God, I pray for the believers. Lord, for any who got into my struggle and their, their joy is bound to their circumstances, they're just trying to get everything set straight so they can finally rest. I pray, give them freedom this morning to look to the person who has accomplished their salvation, the one who has given them a certain hope, the one thing that can never be taken away. The devil can never snatch you out of his hands. God, let them look to what Jesus has accomplished. He has accomplished glory for his children, his brothers and sisters. God, thank you for this hope. I pray that those who walked in discouraged, Lord, that you will take these tribulations and you will drive them to hope. You will drive them to this gospel, to where this is all moving, where it's leading, that they would fix their eyes on the author and perfecter of faith. They would just keep running till they see Jesus. God, I pray, grant that gift to suffering, hurting believers here this morning. God, let the brethren come alongside and love them and help them and point them to that sweet hope. God, move in a a million different pains and sorrows this morning and help us on our, our journey to glory. I pray for the message tonight that will take these truths and dig them deeper. In Psalm 73, God, will you bless the saints tonight? Cause hearts to to come to hear this beautiful word and that you be with Daniel, God. Empower him as he proclaims this message. Do mighty things uh, in the midst tonight. God, thank you uh, for Psalm 73 and what you've done in this man's heart. He's going to proclaim it in humility and brokenness and faith. God, work in your children, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen.